Let's, let's look just real quickly at Mark four before he goes through it a little bit, just because I want you to see the context of what he's saying. Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? Uh, how then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word and goes on to talk about that. Um, oh, well, back in verse 11, he told them the secret of the kingdom of God. They're asking the question, why are you keep speaking to everybody in parables? And in verse 11, he tells them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in a parable so that they may so they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So there is the potential of them be forgiven here. Now, one of the answers the Calvinists will give is that, well, that that's just hyperbole. That's just, um, uh, you know, po- you know, that's not really possible um, and, and those kinds of things. Well, then you've got to you've got to pretty much take away the, the plain meaning of the text. In, in my estimation, I think you have to stretch it. He goes on to, to give an explanation of the parable, but I, I wanted to. The, point I really wanted you to see is down here in verse 34, I believe it is. Verse 33, with similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything. Look at this. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. Some some translations even use the word riddle here. Okay. He, he always spoke to those on the outside using parables, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. See that? This is this is revealing the strategy that Jesus had while he was down from heaven to speak plainly to his apostles, to those closest to him, the closest disciples to him, to uh, explain these things to them. But to the, the Pharisees, the hardened, already self-calloused, hardened people, those people he's speaking to them in parabolic language so as to keep them in their condition. As I, I talked about before with self-hardening, this is where you are refusing stubborn your and your stubborn refusing to to stubborn your stubborn refusal to believe the truth of God. So you grow calloused to it, as we saw there in Acts twenty eight. Judicial hardening, on the other hand, is an act of a judge, and so that's why it's called judicial. So who's the judge here? God is. Okay. So if God's judicial hardening, what does that mean? This is God's active role in blinding already rebellious person in their rebellion so as to prevent their repentance for a time. Once one is cut off in their rebellion, God may use their bad behavior to bring about his plan. God's motive is always to accomplish a greater redemptive purpose through their rebellious actions, often including the potential redemption, even of those being judicially blinded. Now, notice I say potential there because JD actually gets that wrong about our position. He seems to think we believe that everyone who is hardened here or blinded here will will certainly come to, to faith later, and that's not true. It just simply means that you know people come to faith through revelation, and uh, so through gospel appeal. And so, for example, if, if you want somebody, let's say you got a friend, you want him to go to a party with you, and you go to him and say, well, hey, will you go to this party with me? Nah, I don't really want to. Oh, come on, come on, go to this party. And you beg them, and you beg them, and you beg them, and eventually, they're just not even hearing your invitation anymore, okay? So eventually, what do you do? You stop inviting them. Okay. You might even kind of maybe get a little bit upset with them and go, you know what? I don't even want them to come. I don't even want them to know when it is. I don't want to even have any indication of the party because I am so mad at them. I don't want them there right now. It wouldn't serve my purpose for them to be there, whatever it is. Okay. So you're kind of catching the parallel there. That's the way God can be too. I bring them the gospel. I bring them light. I bring them revelation. I bring it to them again and again and again. They continue to reject it. Eventually, I'm going to go, nope, not to you anymore. I'm going to take it over here to these people instead. So I'm going to leave you out. I'm, I'm cutting you off. That's what judicial hardening is. It's blinding somebody from the truth so as to prevent them from uh, from coming to understand the truth for a time, so as to accomplish a purpose through their their bad behavior. Uh, the the crime scene, op, you know, we, we've talked about different ones. Um, the the cop hiding um, himself in a in a, um, in a in a speed trap. Um, he's hiding his presence. Why? So the speeders will keep doing what they're already doing. Because if they knew he was there, they would slow down. So he hides himself. So they'll keep doing what they want to do already. Well, in the same way, God can hide his presence. The fact that he's a Messiah, that he's their Messiah, he's there. He can hide that truth so that they'll keep doing what they want to do, which is to rebel in order to accomplish a purpose through their rebellion. That's what is meant by judicial hardening. And in my book, I have citations where all the terms are used 
to, to refer to self-hardening and all the times where it's referring to judicial hardening in the scriptures and it lays it out. So Potter's Promise, book plug here real quick. Potter's Promise, found it on Amazon. You can find it on Amazon. Kindle's pretty cheap. Um, grab that if you don't have it yet. Uh, it's like 10, 10, $15 at most. So um, that, that goes through all of that. And so it, it's just very simple to understand when you when you get this. Uh, and once it clicks, it's like, oh man, Calvinism doesn't make any sense anymore. To, I don't have any reason to adopt Calvinism once I understood the concept of hardening, judicial hardening, the concept of, of that you're not as born as bad as you could be, but you're also not born as blind as you could be either. Um, once I got that, then then Calvinism began to take a, a you know a, a back kind of a back burner for me in my life, and eventually just took it off uh, altogether.